Welcome back to our week of action via EIT Climate Kick. We are here to celebrate climate innovations and entrepreneurs all over the world and talk to our partners who are boosting them and enabling them to grow and scale. We are now talking to a very interesting panel about how we are boosting climate entrepreneurship in Asia, in very different countries. Before I introduce the panelists, I really want to welcome you to stay tuned for the day three today. We have many sessions happening. There will be a pioneer session, for example, in just an hour happening. There will be many more sessions during the day and during the week. So please, audience, when you have questions, stay curious, ask any questions to the panelists or to the participants in these sessions. Be curious, challenge them a bit. I think that's worth it. And we'll have time after the session to really go into your questions and ask them to the panelists. I think it's important to say that our day three today is focused on energy. So as soon as you are working on any ideas or innovations related to energy, feel free to post them and make them visible under our hashtag Destination 1.5. I repeat, hashtag Destination 1 point spelled out 5. So I, I believe we do have my panelists right now with us here. So let's, let's see. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you doing? Good afternoon in China and India. Very good. Very good. Hi, morning. Hi, Christine. I will quickly introduce you and then I will ask you to introduce yourself. So we have Prata Raju here, who is leading Climate Collective in India. We have Johnson Su with us, who is leading Tao Ventures in China, in Shanghai. And we've got Patrick Bostils here, who is leading Now Sprint Accelerator in Turkey. Gentlemen, please introduce yourselves. We will go with Prata first. Then we'll have Johnson and Patrick to talk a bit more, right? And audience, remember to ask many, many questions. Go ahead, gentlemen. All right. Hi. Thank you. This is um, great to be able to speak to more people about something that I've been working on for uh, over a decade now, uh, climate. Um, what we do here in India, and we actually did start with Climate Kick back in 2017, is to take what uh, my experience as an entrepreneur for about 15 years and help others uh, find solutions and go to the market and, and support the climate. So we started with a uh, climate launchpad program in 2017. India is, is a, um, uh, was relatively new to entrepreneurship in this space, even though the startup boom or our ecosystem started developing about 15, 17 years ago. And after a couple of quiet years, something really uh, amazing happened. Um, people were really interested in in climate entrepreneurship. So now we've we've seen an explosion of interest in products on the ground, innovation in incubators, more and more startups getting funding. Um, uh, give you, I think, give you a sense of the um, um, size that we are seeing, at least in terms of our programs. We've had about six hundred and ten clean tech accelerators join our programs over the last three and a half to four years. That's amazing compared to when we started with a small solar hackathon in 2016 that, that was relatively quiet after. Now, um, I think what we're also seeing uh, is a lot of uh, maturity in this space where, where, where it was initially energy starting off in 2016, uh, you know, 17, an explosion of interest in circular economy. And that's driving a lot more people into the space, especially women entrepreneurs we run a few women uh, focused programs as well in circular economy. Um, and they're quite exciting to see coming to the ground because it's not just the supply side or the startup side, it's the um, entire ecosystem is starting to align. The funding is starting to get formed. The uh, government policies, for example, EPR, extended producer responsibility, start to take shape and push corporates to, to look for solutions. And of course, a, a significant portion of the uh, startups that we see, uh, if not the vast majority, add value to customers, whether they're business or consumers, on their own. So we're seeing a momentum on itself from the private sector. So it's very exciting to share what I've seen over the last few years in India and South Asia. We're active in Sri Lanka and Maldives as well here and through a partner in Nepal. Thank you. Thanks, Pratap. Johnson, go ahead. Uh, this is Johnson. Hello, everyone. So so talking talk about my side, I have been with Think Capital for over five years, and uh, we are the first uh, venture capital firm in China who are focusing on the impact investment. And we have offices in Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and one colleague in the U.S. So Top Venture Partner is our, so it's a new community we just built this year, together with our partners from Europe. And uh, we have been working with Climate KIC to, to launch a 
an accelerator and an early stage fund in China targeting those climate tech startups. Perfect, perfect. Patrick, go ahead. Uh, hello, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be here, of course. Uh, Audible Steels, as you can uh, maybe imagine, my name is uh, not Turkish not, nor uh, South Asian. Uh, I'm actually Belgian. I came to Turkey around nine years ago. Uh, together with my wife and partner, we started a platform for startups. Uh, first, basically aiming at the Turkish startups, uh, then going around Turkey itself. So we are now, I dare to say, the, the biggest independent uh, startup community builder here in Turkey. We moved out from uh, Istanbul to Izmir uh, and trying to continue to build the ecosystem here. Um, with Stageco, what we were doing mainly was giving workshops, startup weekends, hackathons, anything that had to do to help startups uh, get started. Uh, we were already almost always in the early stage um, places. Uh, where teams are sometimes not complete or ideas are not validated, uh, prototypes still have to be made. So I like I like to work on the early stage uh, teams. That's where we can have actually the, the most impact, uh, to, to my opinion. Then um, actually, thanks to COVID, I started my own accelerator. I wanted to start actually in Izmir specifically. So Izmir is a big city in Turkey, 4 million people. Um, but thanks to COVID, I had to go online. And before I knew it, I was actually having a global accelerator uh, based on SDGs. And I, I wanted to include three parts of, of the world where I think uh, we, can, we can have uh, impact because that's for me the most important thing. So that was, of course, the Balkans, uh, East, uh, Eastern uh, Africa. But also I really wanted to explore what could be done in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, so in the meantime, after a year, one year and a half now, I already did five cohorts. We are now actually in our fifth one at, the, at, the, at this moment. Uh, this one is now a vertical, it's agriculture impact. Uh, as I said, always um, SEG based uh, women entrepreneurs first. That's a little bit how we select the teams. Uh, now Sprint Accelerator as, um, as a program is totally bootstrapped. So I started on my own. I have some friends who helped me. Uh, doing some of the workshops, but mainly 80% of the work I do just on myself here in front of my computer, like I'm sitting here now. Uh, the program is one month online, eight workshops, and then a pitch day uh, in front of uh, real investors. So that has been quite uh, quite an adventure. And actually, for me, it was also kind of an MVP um, for myself, this accelerator program. And today I'm very, very happy that uh, I can also... Um, be part of the climate accelerator uh, program because as i said uh, sdgs are very important but if we go even a step further i can already see it in food so in food it is already so agriculture is already a step forward uh, and i think a climate accelerate acceleration is it's a small step it's a small drop in the ocean but i think we have to create a lot of drops because don't forget uh, the ocean is built from drops of water so i think everything that we can do we should do in, in what we're doing thank you Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Pratab, I want to ask you a bit a first question and we will ask you a first question to all of you a bit about what's happening in your region, in your country, and then we will go into some details. Pratab, in a short summary, what has been happening in climate and entrepreneurship? You already started talking about this, but please tell us a bit more and what do you think will happen in the future? Right, right. Yeah, I did touch upon this in the introduction and um, from um, a very slow, uh, late start, uh, I think um, and the main reason for a late start is we really in India uh, and South Asia started supporting um, the building the startup ecosystem late as well. It's only about 15 years, 17 years before even the e-commerce or food delivery startups and all these started coming out in India. And the um, uh, we were battling many things here, you know, uh, of course, um, you know, what is a startup? Does it make money? Should investors put into it? These are these are basic questions that are were relatively new in India uh, 15 years ago. And, and then we were battling other stuff uh, in my, in our space in climate. Why is, is climate a business? Is this, this is good what you're doing, but isn't this for CSR or just the government to support, but not for commercial or private business or investors. And this takes time. Um, when we started, when I started in solar in 2009, 
most people didn't believe solar would work and it's not a viable option for India 2013-14. We start we had I think 10,000 megawatts on the ground and we have 40 or 50,000 now. Things can change very fast um, um, uh, once people start to see the activity on the ground and results on the ground. So I think something similar is happening right now with with when we started it was a lot of um, you know in, incredulity that climate and and business or startups could go hand in hand. We're seeing startups um, um, generate revenue. I think that's the easiest and most powerful way to get, get belief that this is actually a startup business. Maybe we take it for granted globally, but in new ecosystems, especially in Asia, especially you know when we're used to business uh, uh, promoters and entrepreneurs who who support family, family-grown businesses. It's quite common here, at least in South Asia. The idea of some young kid with a great idea should be supported uh, was not was not straightforward. But uh, I think now that that the fitting from the clean tech space is the fact that the ecosystem is starting to be accepted. And India now has a pretty startup ecosystem as well. Some, I don't know, 50,000 startups or something like that. In clean tech, we're now able to 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 migrate more stakeholders, the government, we're seeing at the state government level, more people finding clean tech to be a startup domain uh, to support, which means funding for startups, clean tech startups. We're seeing, of course, investors slowly inch in. Uh, this is great as well. And, and the most important is we're seeing uh, entrepreneurs. You know, um, sometimes you, you have stakeholders, but they're looking for solutions. Now, we, before you have solutions, you have years of ecosystem development. You know, if you want to to kind of look at the you know do, uh, dozens of big industries that do need solutions, you need you need many people taking risks, and this is a long process. We all know. So I think uh, we're we're seeing the momentum now. It's still an early stage ecosystem, and one metric we can use as from the funding side, the bulk of our startups are starting to get to pre Series A, you know, kind of funding. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds, and only dozens at the Series A and B and above. But this is just a matter of time. We're, you know, when you look at pipelines, we're looking at uh, demand from all stakeholders. Everything is lighting well. Our goal right now is to be is to kind of support this this movement from getting to that big hurdle, getting to the market, getting that first key pilot. Oftentimes, these early pilots are, if they're government supported, they don't get the acceptance yet. You need real strong commercial um, uh, uh, deployment pilots. All this stuff. And I think especially with the experience with Climate Kick in particular, uh, we're able to learn and not have to recreate things from scratch. And this has really helped us as a Climate Collective um, reach the scale that we are right now. Uh, and it's not just the accelerator platform. Climate Kick has this great marketplace that we're talking to to see how to, to, to bring in more capital besides what's available here in India and all the other programs as we slowly grow more with uh, Climate Kick here in India as well. Thank you, thank you, Pratap, for the for the summary. Johnson, what's happening in China then? Unmute yourself, please, Johnson. Still muted. You're still muted, Johnson. Johnson, you're still muted. Let's let's continue with Patrick for a second. Patrick, what's happening in Turkey and Eastern Africa? Oh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, you, can, you can continue, continue, continue. Sorry. Um, so, you know, China has recently made a pledge, you know, to achieve CO2 emission peak before 2030 and then carbon net zero by 2060. You know, China accounts for roughly 30% uh, of global CO2 emissions. So it is very critical to the planet's future climate. But the challenge is how to turn these goals into, you know, through domestic policies. Um, you know, China's energy consumption still heavily relies on coal, which fuels nearly 60%. And the coal price is much lower in China than the renewable energy, which almost, you know, the whole economy are benefiting from this. I hope the transition, you know, can be smooth without too much hurt, to, you, know, you know, to the quality of people's life, especially to those, you know, social vulnerable groups. So we are already feeling the pain, you know, of power shortage these days. To meet the deadline, we need some more innovation in technologies rather than just investing into these capital intensive projects. And just a few days ago, we have seen, you know, 
the government has at least the specific goals and measures it will take, you know, to achieve its carbon emissions peak and carbon neutrality goals, such as banning unplanned new, new oil refining and coal projects. So the guideline introduced a roadmap, you know, for achieving the carbon peak by 2030 and neutrality by 2060. So we will see some more details later on. Okay, very, we'll, we will be very curious about that. Patrick, what's happening in Turkey? Where is this, all these two big countries out there? What do you think? Well, actually, uh, of course, uh, Turkey is a very big country. It's, yeah. it's uh, between uh, Asia and, uh, and Europe, so it has a very strategic uh, place. We have, to, we have to always look at what are developing countries doing and what, what are developed countries doing. And in the, at the end of the day, we are talking about startups, uh, what Praha also already mentioned. So entrepreneurship, which is the part, of, which is actually for me, startups, entrepreneurship is about starting your own business and you can live from that business and you can grow your business. That's the basic thing. So it's a commercial uh, institution. And the discussion today is, and that's also what we see here in, in Turkey and, and around, um, we had social entrepreneurship and that for me was more looking like uh, NGOs who were trying to make a business plan, which of course didn't succeed. So now we don't hear too much about social entrepreneurship anymore. And I'm a little bit afraid that this could be the same thing in, in, in climate change. So, so for the climate change is a very complex uh, global thing. So a startup itself can do small things, but in the end of the day, the policymakers are going to do the big change. I mean, because it is about change. This is, the reason why uh, changes in climate change is that we have to change what we're doing today. Um, and startups are only a very, very little part of that. So we should definitely continue to do it. But startups at the end of the day have to make money. They have to have a market where they can sell their products or their services. So it's a very complex thing. And um, I can see that also in, in Turkey. So in the end of the day, when I look at the uh, East African startups or the Turkish startups, or even Southeast, uh, uh, Southeast Asia startups. They are trying to make something that that provides them money because that's how we live today. We buy our bread and we have a house above our head or a roof above our head because we pay for these things. So it's a uh, it's a way of to 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 make your own money instead of going to work somewhere. So in the same thing, so we don't see too many initiatives today because there is not the overall policies uh, are not yet ready yet to, to embrace that uh, from an investor point of view. So, OK, the green investments are growing, um, but I don't see that too much here. I see this in the States and I see this in, in Europe, but I see this. I don't see this in developing countries. There are, of course, always some initiatives who take some uh, some light and people then see them. But if you look at. Uh, if you look at 100 startups today in, in this region, then uh, 90 of them are pure, pure making something that they think uh, an audience will need and they will pay for it. And all the rest has maybe uh, other, other values uh, like climate change or using the SDGs as their, as their drive. So, so a lot of room from, for, uh, for growth. Uh, a lot of possibilities are still open. Uh, but the, the main frame, the, the main things are missing today uh, because they're from the policymakers. They're not from the startups. I mean, the startups have to abide by the rules and the laws that there are today. If I look around in Turkey today, I don't see solar panels on homes. And that always strikes me. So if I go to Belgium, for example, every home has a sun panel and they don't have sun in Belgium. So <laughs> like this is very weird. So in Turkey, we always have sun and we don't have sunroof panels. And in Belgium, we don't have sun and it's full of sunroof panels. So then I'm like, okay, for me, it has to make sense. So and, and the common sense for me is a little bit missing now. And that, that's, that's why I like uh, the, the word resistance. Uh, so we are the resistance. We are telling to people, hey, guys, we have to change all these things. Otherwise, nothing is going to happen tomorrow. So that's a little bit, I think, where especially developing countries are today. I think I, I couldn't agree more. And this will lead me to the next question, which I will ask to Patrick and Johnson afterwards. So why are you starting and working towards an accelerator focus on climate? Why? Why do you take this next step? I believe in resistance. Uh, so I'm a, so I like to, I like to l learn from history. So weirdly enough, um, every generation learns the same thing. Means 
Every generation makes the same mistakes. <laughs> we, did, we actually we don't learn anything. Um, so I like to look a little bit in in, in history. Um, and for example, I was watching a documentary on the resistance in World War II uh, in Belgium, and the the resistance people were the ones who were actually helping to get rid of the um, the, the, the people who were doing uh, these these things. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep in these things, uh, but. So the resistance was a counter movement. And for me, what I try to do with climate change acceleration, or even with the SDGs, what I'm doing is I want to be a counter movement. I want to show to people, look, there is also an other side of the medal. So now we see so develop, uh, developing countries, the startups, they look at the, uh, the unicorns and they think, oh, I want to be a unicorn first, because that's what they have in their mind. I want to be also a unicorn. And then I say, guys, that's not what it is. It's about creating a company who has an added value to your customers, but also as it, towards the society. It has to be more than just making money and whatever. I don't care about the rest. So that's what that's what I like about the, the climate uh, the climate acceleration is that showing an other way of doing things, showing an other side of how you can do business, and it's the hardest one. I I'm, I have to be honest in climate change that is more against you than ahead than with you there is no investor there is no there are no re really good policy makers who are really into these things everybody is for the short win um in, in turkey i always have to we're always laughing with this um uh, short term is uh, tomorrow midterm is the day after and long term is three days further away so that's a little bit how I see this in, in many developing countries because everybody's taking what he can take because tomorrow it can be over. That's how we live. I mean, that's how we live. So in, uh, in Germany, uh, people, they uh, book their holidays two years ahead. Uh, if we book a holiday, it's one week ahead. That's the, that's the mentality. That's how we are. That's the culture that we are living in. So for me, starting the, the, the climate and, and joining this group of people, which actually are all nuts people eh? because we are thinking that we can change the world. And of course we can't, but if we don't do anything, and that was what the resistance was doing also in the second world, if we don't do anything, I mean, I can, I, I cannot do that. I mean, Praha was talking about kids. I also have kids. I mean, we have to think about the future, not of our future. We have to think about the kids future and their kids. So it's a kind of resistance for me. That's, that's what I like about the, the climate change. Uh, uh, accelerated. Very good, very good comparison. Johnson, what do you think about this and why are you starting this accelerator step and climate accelerator? You're muted, you're muted, Johnson. Johnson likes to be muted, I think. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about it. He likes the button. <laughs> he likes the button. <laughs> yeah. You know, first of all, you know, so <laughs> the, the carbon net zero plan is very aggressive, I think, you know, the policy is to reduce Carbon emissions will be more effective if we combine it with uh, some new technologies and innovations, which improves the resource efficiency, rather than just you know relying on the administrative production reduction. You know. So according to a forecast you know, from Goldman Sachs, the country's potential in the path to the net zero by sector and technology will bring about uh, 16 trillion dollars in you know, clean tech in investment by 2060. So. And we will also create uh, something like 40 million net new jobs and drive economic growth. So it is a huge market and I think it is a perfect time for us to join in. And secondly, you know, uh, the, pan uh, the pandemic has isolated the whole world for about for almost two years. And we have seen so much turbulence in, in what it, World politics, you know, to fight climate change might be the only um, common goal for all the countries. After all, we are all human beings, and it is everyone's mission to care about the long-term sustainability. You know, this is a business that we can do for the rest of our lives. And um, last but not least, you know, we have seen see any other, you know, climate tech. We haven't not see, see any other, you know, climate tech focused accelerators in China yet. You know, most of the capitals were poured into the internet, you know, e-commerce or smart technologies to pursue, you know, the fast and the high returns. Well, climate tech now is a huge attractive market, but with very so few players in it. 
and I think I think that's a, many good arguments and many opportunities for you to get started there. And we do hope, obviously, that in the United Nations Climate Conference and COP26 in the next weeks, they all work together, right? Audience, feel yeah. free to ask more questions to the gentleman. We'll have five more minutes and a few more questions. And please feel free to ask your, your, your questions. So Prata, what, what do you think about their stories? And like, wh how was it for you then to start such, such an accelerated journey, let's say? And how do you compare it to their stories? Right, right. No, um, I think uh, Patrick touched upon this uh, when we talk about kids. Now, I was a solo developer for many years. And people used to come to me and say, that's very noble what you're doing. I'm scratching my head thinking I'm trying to sell power at this price, make it less and make that money for myself as a private developer. So it never, I never felt like it was in the climate space. I was a clean tech, um, um, I had a clean tech business or renewable energy business. Then I did have kids about 10 years back and it has changed for me because this, this, this idea of we're, we're doing something as Patrick mentioned, not just for ourselves, but especially for people we know coming up or even whether in our own families or, 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 or all around us. So that really pushed me towards um, when I left the solar business, uh, setting up a climate accelerator in 2016. Now, I don't know, um, I've heard a few things from Johnson and Patrick and um, I, I keep reminding myself of this very, very great Arabic uh, old phrase, I think um, um, 15, 16 years, uh, centuries ago. If someone tries to predict the future, he's lying. Even if it comes out true, he was lying. And that kind of gives you, at least makes us a little bit more <laughs> humble about trying to understand if, if things are going to be uh, different this time. Um, even Lord Templeton, I always use another phrase that he's come up, our quote, uh, this is great. The four most dangerous words in the um, English language, this time it's different. You know, so with those in mind, I do feel uh, there are things, secular trends happening. Uh, these secular trends are, are very positive. There's, there's uh, many stakeholders, especially business people. You know, it's different in different countries. There's more business here um, in India that's, that's supporting climate on a private basis, not from government policy, etc. That gives me hope that there's legs to push in climate. And, and, and in India, we don't get much funding anyway for climate uh, from the startup ecosystem. We do, it's all private driven. So that's, that's, that complements uh, this secular trend I'm seeing on the demand side. So I'm pretty hopeful that, that this is something that will pick up. There is a, uh, I also want to share my own experience in solar. When solar was above the grid, the, the cost of solar power, nobody wanted solar without um, um, uh, subsidies. And even then, not sure. When it was below the grid, we were all going home solar. Solar is actually for uh, uh, additional capacity versus coal is about one third the price of new coal plants. So there's no coal being built in India. It's only solar and wind, 90 or 95% for many years now. And that's a, that's a trend across the world. In most countries, it's far two or three, I think something like this. So I do believe there is a role for innovation, even though when we talk about innovation, we're talking about two or three people or sometimes single founder companies trying to, trying to change the world. My ex-wife used to work at a very big uh, financial services company and um, a financial processing company. And it was without fail that they would put in 20 to 50 times more money, five to $10 million into products and never beat that garage based fintech startup. Never. Yeah. They would yeah. they would fail at every project. She was a product manager there as well. She was a digital product manager. So I think there is a lot of a lot of potential here that that last uh, IEA report, International Energy Agency, kind of maps out. Well, if we're going to get to net zero by 2070 or uh, net zero emissions by 2050, 30 to 40 percent of the technologies haven't been invented yet. It's not based on, you know, things that are being prototyped now. They're not invented yet. And startups may you know, play a big role in here. There'll be, of course, corporates and government doing this, but even startups can play a role in in finding these these ways to get adoption or reducing costs, all this stuff. So I'm pretty hopeful that that there's a lot of um, 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 tailwinds here, and the secular trends give me hope that 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 this is going to be a growth area for for decades to come. Because even though we talk about a word like climate change, we're talking about hundreds of different solutions needed are thousands in, in many industries, especially when you throw in circular economy and think about waste from many different industries. We need, we need, we need quite a bit of new innovation and many of this will come from, from uh, startups. 
I also do believe that a, a significant portion will come, especially for those that get adopted in, in developing countries like India locally. I always say that the, the best microgrid uh, solution I've ever seen was this one in, in Berkeley Labs, beautiful. And my, my cousin was the head of the renewable uh, node agency in, in a state called Andhra Pradesh. He used to tell me the biggest problem he faced in putting microgrids in, in, rural, in, in the rural parts of that state was theft of copper wires. That was not put into the design by this, this solution I saw in Berkeley. Um, not, and I'm not saying that, you know, as a result, it's a bad solution. I'm just saying that for solutions that come to the ground, oftentimes local entrepreneurs have an advantage, you know, outside of deep, maybe deep material science and others. And that's, I think that's what's going to be exciting here in India, as well as other developing countries for um, years to come. Very good, very good, very good. Before we go to the questions, in one phrase, each of you, what advice would you give entrepreneurs in your region? In one single phrase, Patrick goes first, then Johnson and Prata. Let's kick ass. Very good. Johnson. <laughs> well, uh, I think it's the right time you know, to do this. Yeah. Right Very time. good. Pratab. Yeah, nothing beats perseverance. Very good, very good. Just give me a few seconds to check out the questions and I'll be right back. Okay, gentlemen, I've got the first question. I heard that both Pratap and Patrick are leading accelerator programs for women. How is the situation of women in clean tech in their region? Patrick first and Pratap. I wish it was more. <laughs> Very good. That's my Pratap. short answer. <laughs> good. Good. That totally counts. Pratap. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, especially in countries like India, where there are significant barriers to women culturally. I and mean, we fight many things that, that maybe in other places taken for granted. The idea in, in especially rural India and in some parts, the idea of even going to school is not culturally accepted in many communities. Maybe it's different in, in the big metros, but even there, there's significant portions here. So it's not just an uh, um, entrepreneurship problem, it's a cultural problem to, to, to be solved. When we did start in uh, 2017, we saw about 6% of the applications came from women in our program. And we ran uh, some uh, accelerators called Private Ready for Women. And that number, I think, is reaching to, uh, can't remember off him, I think it's 36 or 38% in about three years in the applications. And then when I look at one specific area that's very interesting on circular economy, it's, it's, it's majority women, not just applying, but getting, getting accepted into the program. So I think that, uh, yeah, these are all hard for solutions. I think um, uh, there's no lack of talent amongst women. I think that's a given. I think if we put interventions on the ground and we wait, uh, maybe slowly over time, we can, we can slowly increase that. And uh, women, of course, is, is one inclusive inclusion problem uh, target, but there's many um, across our, our countries, um, you know, the rural urban divide, the language divide, if you speak English in India, you will get access to resources. If you speak a local language only, which is reflective of your education, largely, perhaps, uh, you do don't, you don't get this as much access. So I think as long as we continue to recognize that the more people coming into, to entrepreneurship and having that access or that opportunity, the better off we'll be off in terms of not just a more equitable society, but even I believe the solutions will be stronger. In fact, if I may continue, there's a, we've been focusing on gender and climate in particular a framework, and there is a significant amount of um, influence of women in a lot of climate solutions. You know, the insights in consumer uh, uh, um, consumption behavior, oftentimes in many products and many, in many segments is, is driven or be heavily influenced by women, uh, especially in rural India. Having that insight come in through women entrepreneurs would be absolutely amazing. It's not it's not a gender equity goal itself. It, we could see it reflecting in just much stronger solutions on the ground as well. So we're pushing forward for inclusion because I think not just it's right on its own, but I think we'll see better solutions on the ground. Yeah, and I also want to give this question to Johnson. Johnson, how is it in, in China in that sense? I mean, you've been active in this space for many, many years already. I think China is much better, you know, Talking about ourselves, you know, 
So we have a team in China, about 16 people. So only four of us are gentlemen. <coughs> you know, 12, 12 together, other people are all ladies, you know. So it's already a big achievement. And also we have an, another partner in China who are doing who are running accelerators in Shanghai, Dalian, Nanjing, and also Beijing. So, so they are founded by two ladies, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Before we wrap up, one last question to you guys. What do you need the most to help more entrepreneurs? In a short phrase, please. Again, Patrick, Pratap, and Jonathan. For, what do I need? For me personally, I don't need it. I mean, I've started in a very bootstrapped way. So it was me, just me and my friends. Uh, there's no money, there is no sponsoring. And we can see that we have a huge impact. Uh, so each time we have around 10 teams, uh, I know that KPIs most of the time are like, uh, do they have a next round? How much money can they collect? I'm not really into that. For me, it's more like, can they make it a sustainable business? And I see that it is happening today. So, yeah. of course, money makes things easier. Uh, I could create a team. But at the same time, I also like the bootstrapped way because I always say it's my program. So I can kick out people. Uh, I can be nice. I can be not nice. Um, so I kind of like that. That. Uh, uh, that the thing so it becomes always very nice because at the end of the cohorts uh, we all become friends and we are all trying to help each other and the more I can do it the, the better so for me the most the, the only thing that I want is a good health I, I just uh, good. recovered from uh, cancer stomach cancer so I'm still under uh, under uh, after treatment but if my health is good I'll continue and that's what I want to do thank you very good very good very good we'll help you in that sense Pratap and Johnson in a short, short phrase what do you need the most Go. Okay. Okay, I'll go yeah, first. Uh, um, just, I need more money. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's a we are a nonprofit, uh, and nonprofits try to put some impact on the ground and try to experiment and see what works and doesn't. And we have started seeing some success uh, on the ground where programs are growing large. But there, you know, um, I mentioned a, a number at the beginning, 610 startups and some women programs that I think we had 36 women in two uh, accelerators. India is huge. It's a 1.4 billion people, give or take 100 million. I, I don't think people actually know how many people are in India. Um, I think that uh, especially with the partners we have, and we have uh, not just Climate Kick, but uh, other good partners in the region, we can increase the impact on the ground by getting the capital needed to grow as well as getting more capital to to uh, startups early stage, uh, especially before the private sector, we can crowd in the private sector with their capital. Yeah, very good. In a nutshell. Very good. Johnson. Sure, yeah, we have some management fees already, you know, you know, to run this program, but still we need some more money, you know, more funding you know, to help us to, you know, to enlarge this team and have some more, you know, talents to join us, you know, because we are going to, you know, have some more PR, you know, you know, and also to, to, you know, to make this a big thing, you know, for us to, to, uh, to, to be known by everybody, you know, you know, and, you know, we are doing the first cry tech, you know, cry tech focused, you know, accelerator in China. So we need some more, you know, you know resources on this. Definitely. Thank you. All right, very good, gentlemen. Thank you for your time today. We've had Johnson Su, partner at Sync Capital and Tao Ventures here with the Future China Climate Accelerator. We've got Prata Braju here, co-founder and leader of Climate Collective at the Future Adaptation Resilience Climate Accelerator in India. And Patrick Postiles here from Now Sprint Accelerator who will run quite a few climate accelerators in Turkey and, and Eastern, even Eastern Africa and the Baltics here. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining in and thank you for this time. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great, bye, bye, bye. and thank you to the panel, and thank you, Christian. Sure. Thank you, all the guys. Thank you, thank you. Sure, sure, sure. Bye, bye. To the audience, stay tuned, please. In just 20 minutes, we will have the next sessions on our Pioneer session with Lisa and Sam. And then during the day, we'll have some more sessions with our Climate Fund partners and some future climate accelerators across Europe. Stay tuned, listen in, and see you soon again. Thank you. Bye-bye.